the number one fear for all parents wasn't drugs, alcohol abuse, or gangs. It was something much more evil and insidious. Dungeons and Dragons. You hear how ridiculous that sounds now? People were seriously afraid of this stuff back then. Mazes and Monsters is a 1982 made-for-television fantasy drama from director Stephen Hillard Stern. The movie begins with the police and fire department searching an abandoned mine for a missing college student. Look, we heard a game of mazes and monsters got a little out of hand over at the university. Seconds, bud. Mazes and monsters? Right. We'd say Dungeons and Dragons, but we don't want to get sued. The news vultures explain that a student was lost in the caves because of something that happened in the game. We then cut to six months earlier with one of the sappiest and most melodramatic songs ever. Whatever may happen, where the road may I feel like this should be played over footage of sad puppies. Always remember we are our special Super Kid Genius JJ is stopping home after a live-action role-playing session of Hogan's Heroes. JJ's family's rich and mentally unstable, so while he was away, his mother redecorated his room to look like a giant bathroom. Where's all my stuff? My furniture? My stroke mags! JJ has a pet bird, Merlin, who is definitely my favorite character in the movie. And Merlin hates it too, don't you? Birds can't talk. Kate's talking with her mother about how she wants to be a famous writer. By the way, how is the writing coming? I've got writer's block, but I finally figured out why. It's because I haven't really lived yet, so how can I write about things I don't know about? Just ask Stephanie Meyer. Over in suburbia, Daniel's having dinner with his parents, where I think he's trying to break up with them. It's not you. It's me. Daniel's parents are trying to give him some terrible advice. What I really love is to make up games for computers. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do it as a hobby. Daniel, your father and I are not telling you not to enjoy life. We're just telling you not to waste it. Yeah, there's no money to be made in games and game-related development. At Grant University, the new school year is starting. JJ, Kate, and Daniel are all in a group that plays Mazes and Monsters. They lost their fourth player, so they're putting up flyers looking for a replacement. Robbie's a transfer student, and Tom Hanks... What do you think he's more embarrassed by? This movie or that time he did the white guy dragnet rap? Well, I'm here tonight to rap about your right. Cause right now you're in trouble. You don't have to say nothing at all. Y'all got two calls and you better make them on the double. This is a city of crime. Robbie's parents drop him off a grant. JJ's sitting in the cafeteria hoping someone sees his flyer. Robbie's reading the flyer, and immediately JJ strikes. JJ asks Robbie to join the group, but he declines. Maybe he'd have better luck if he wasn't dressed up like an aviator from the 1940s. He then invites him to a party he's having that evening. These college parties are a lot different than the ones that I used to go to. I'm sensing a theme here. JJ is wacky hat guy. Robbie runs into Kate, and this could be the first recorded case of a girl picking up a guy because he plays a role-playing game. I played a game called Mazes and Monsters a little too much. You're kidding. What level? Uh, ninth. Ninth level. So am I. Kate introduces Robbie to Daniel in the group and convinces him to join them. Look at how much they make this sound like drugs. Hey, you gonna uh, play with us? Well, no, I really, I can't. My folks... Hey, we're not fanatics. Well, how often do you play? Oh, a couple times a week. Thanks. Come so on, no, Robbie. And if you don't like it, if it's too much, you can always quit. Also, it's very subtle, but check this out. Dungeons and Dragons is bad, but underage drinking is okay. The next night, the group starts their first campaign together. Gall staff, you have entered the door to the north. You are now by yourself, standing in a dark room. The pungent stench of mildew emanates from the wet dungeon walls. Where are the Cheetos? Daniel's playing the dungeon master, and the rest of the group introduce their characters. I am you, a holy man. In reaching the ninth level, I have acquired many magic spells and charms, the greatest of which is the graven eye of Timur. But I also have a sword, which I only use should my magic fail me. Uh, clerics use maces, not swords. What kind of garbage is this? Robbie sees Kate in the library. Oh, maybe this giant pile of books will hide my boner. He sits next to her, and since the theme music starts playing and it fades to a montage, it must mean they're falling in love. Robbie tells Kate about how three years ago his brother ran away to New York and the family never heard from him again. JJ goes to talk to Kate to find out if she wants to play later, and is shocked to see Robbie in her room. Not for nothing, kid, but if you're bummed out about not having a girlfriend, 
you might want to ditch the stupid hat gimmick. JJ tells Merlin he's going to go kill himself in Pequod Caverns nearby. JJ heads into the caverns and decides that instead of killing himself, he's going to convince the group to live-action roleplay there. The next night when they're playing the game, JJ purposely kills his character. Freelick jumps into the pit to gather the treasure. How much does Freelick get? It's a trap. No. The pit is filled with sharp, gem-encrusted spikes. Freelick, the fanatic of Glossomere, is impaled and dies. He doesn't even get a saving throw? JJ, get out of here! You're dead! You don't exist anymore! Now that JJ's character's dead, he convinces the group to start a new game that he'll run in the Pequod Caverns. JJ bribes one of the guys in the science lab to get a skeleton. Didn't he just say... We'll have to keep it absolutely secret. And now, after a tiny bit of prodding... I'm inventing the ultimate game of mazes and monsters. Pequod Caverns. Kid can't even keep his own secrets. They head out in costume to Pequod Caverns. JJ hides to be the disembodied voice of the Dungeon Master. They run into the skeleton that gives them a clue. In a brilliant move, they all separate. All alone, Robbie runs into a lizard man and proceeds to lose his mind. The group rushes to find him and sees that nothing was attacking him, it was all in his head. They leave the cave loving the game, all except for Robbie, who starts to lose it. And in case we weren't sure of this, Kate rams the point home. The most frightening monsters are the ones that exist in our minds. That night, Robbie has a nightmare about the Great Hall, which appears to be a guy standing at the other end of a storm drain. You must be holy in all your life. You must be pious, humble, celibate. But come on, really? I like having sex. The next day, Robbie breaks up with Kate. Now that Kate's single and vulnerable, Daniel moves in. Robbie's continuing to have dreams of the Great Hall, and now he's making a map that mentions the two towers. Kate sees Daniel's bike outside the cave, so she goes in looking for him, but gets lost. Daniel hears her and comes to her rescue. Daniel tells Kate he was cheating by looking in the caves to find where JJ hid the treasure. He then uses the smoothest geek pickup line I've ever heard. You know, I, I was always like Mr. Spock from Star Trek. I thought I had no feelings like a Vulcan. I never thought I could fall in love. JJ's throwing a Halloween party and... Wait, now he's not wearing a hat? On the one night it would actually make sense? That night Robbie goes completely off the deep end. Daniel goes looking for Robbie and sees that he's gone. He tells the others and they call his parents looking for him. They search his room and find the map he made. You think he might have been reading Lord of the Rings? Worried that Robbie got hurt in the caverns, they go looking for him. After that, they go to the police station where the boom mic is to tell them Robbie's missing and they think he might be in the Pequod Caverns. Detective Martini goes to talk to JJ. I like how immediately the game is portrayed as evil. Like mazes and monsters. You mean the game? Yes, Robbie was getting peculiar. It was, uh... It was like the, the game was becoming his whole life, and, and sometimes he was more interested in it than me. One of the players Robbie played with got carried away and killed him. Well, that's kind of far out. Mazes and Monsters is a far out game. He then interrogates Daniel and asks all the important questions. Robbie a doper? JJ suggests they give the cops the map. I don't think Daniel understands the meaning of the word hid. We could give my map of the caverns to the cops. What map? I thought you said you hid everything. And we're back to the beginning of the movie. Or the beginning of... Police squad in color. The police search the caverns, but they don't find anything. Kate starts to piece together what happened to Robbie. Boom, Mike. It's okay, Robbie just went to New York to see Slayer. So he walked all the way to New York? Robbie gets attacked by some muggers. He gets cornered in an alleyway and stabs one with his dagger, thinking it's a lizard man. This snaps Robbie out of it and he calls Kate. He then displays some of his future Oscar-winning acting skills. Where are you exactly? <laughs> There's blood on my knife! Knife? What happened? And it's on my hands! I think I killed somebody! I know I killed somebody! Kate tells Robbie to go to JJ's house and they'll come and get him. Why did she wait until morning to go and get him? I guess she needed a full night's rest before she could go rescue her friend. Robbie slips back into his delusional state and heads into the subway, which he thinks is the maze. He runs into a bum who he mistakes for a king. He asks where he can find the two towers, which are, uh, anyway. The group stops at JJ's place to find that Robbie never made it there. They finally figured out where they have to go. Oh, where's my brain? The two towers are the twin towers, the World Trade Center. 
They search all over the World Trade Center looking for him. Seven days a week now. Seven days a week. You've even got me talking in my sleep. Seven days a week. They find him on the roof right before he can jump off. I am the maze controller. Maze co Maze control. Yes. And I have absolute authority in this game. Game? Game. Ooh, that's deep. Three months later, the group's headed to Robbie's house to visit him, since he dropped out of college. They go to see him, but he's still stuck in his character. The group then decides to go on one last adventure with their friend. And so, we played the game again, for one last time. It didn't matter that there were no maps, or dice, or no monsters. Hard you saw the monsters. We did not. We saw nothing but the death of hope, and the loss of our friend. And so we played the game until the sun began to set, and all the monsters were dead. And that's depressing. The movie was shot in 1982 for airing on the CBS network. It was based off the novel of the same name by Rona Jaffe, which was loosely based on the disappearance of James Dallas Egbert III. Egbert was a child prodigy that was already in college, even though he was only 16. He tried numerous times to kill himself, and one day, after running away from school, he succeeded. A private investigator was hired to look into this, and even though he did play D&D, the investigator came to the conclusion that the real reason he killed himself was the combination of the fact that he was under an incredible amount of pressure from his family. He was also a drug addict and a closet homosexual. He knew his parents wouldn't approve of this, so he ended his life. The investigator, William Deere, didn't release any of this information to the public until years later in the book The Dungeon Master. Unfortunately, since there was already a full-on witch hunt in progress, the blame came down on the game. It was accused of leading kids into Satanism, witchcraft, and even suicide. Religious zealots, armed with nothing but misinformation and false facts, rallied against this evil game and told anyone who would listen. Bink Pulling was a kid with severe mental issues that killed himself in 1982. While investigating, the police found he had several D&D books, and even though there was no link between the books and his death, his mother still blamed the game. She started the group Bad, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, in an attempt to rid the world of the game. Since he had played the game at school, she sued the principal, and later TSR, the game's publisher. Both cases were thrown out of court. Even still, the damage was done. When Mazes and Monsters was released on television, it wasn't viewed so much as one kid's battle with mental issues that manifested itself in schizophrenia, but more about the evils of what is essentially a board game. In 1984, a publication was released called Dark Dungeons. They showed how the evils of this game could drive someone to suicide, and how it's not really a game, but a recruitment tool for devil worshippers. In the end, the only salvation is to give yourself to God and burn those awful books, which a lot of parents did. This looks hilarious now, and it is, but back then, people took this seriously. According to this, at the 8th level, Debbie's brought into a coven and taught real spells. Real spells that work! Where do I have to go to learn how to cast spells? I want to cast Magic Missile. Considering the writer doesn't even know the difference between a wizard and a cleric, I can't see how anyone would be taking this too seriously. To show how far we've come, a group of independent filmmakers are doing a spoof adaptation that should be out this summer, and it looks pretty fantastic. This is a joint effort from the group that did the Gamers movies, so it should be all kinds of awesome. Religion loves to make everything evil. Even something like Pokemon, they twist and make it look like it's a gateway into devil worship. So Pokemon is a game that teaches children how to enter into the world of witchcraft, how to cast spells, how to use psychic phenomena, how to put work supernatural powers against their enemies, how to fantasy role play. Pokemon world is a world of the demonic, of the satanic. But while you might not take it quite seriously, I assure you that demons take it quite seriously. Satan takes it quite seriously. Do you remember the Dun Dungeons and Dragons game of the 80s where uh, children, young people even, ended up killing themselves because it was a role-playing game? Our kids are going out in gangs on the streets and they're so used to killing each other in their fantasy games and on their video screens and blowing each other away and blowing each other up. In 1983, another slight against Dungeons and Dragons was a movie called Skullduggery. In the movie, a group of kids get together to play a variation of D&D, and one of them is cursed by the devil, which turns him into a serial killer. 
While Mazes and Monsters is funny, but turns a little sad towards the end, Skullduggery is hilarious. In an odd connection, Wendy Crewson, who played Kate, was also one of the characters in Skullduggery. In a clear case of trying to mislead audiences, here's the original VHS cover for the movie. Years later, when Tom Hanks was a huge star, they re-released it on DVD with a cover that made it look like it was more of a recent film, since they used a picture of an older Tom Hanks. Mazes and Monsters is a bizarre film. It's a time capsule of just how ignorant people were in regards to Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games in general back then. Now with all kinds of games being mainstream and things like the Harry Potter books flying off the shelves, Dungeons and Dragons isn't even remotely considered dangerous anymore. It's crazy to think of just how scared people were of this. About the worst thing D&D can do to you is make you have an active imagination and possibly a larger pant size. What am I doing here?